I want to ask you all a question, and I'm going to answer it in one of the form of my previous jobs. How many people here love the merciful Jesus? Oh, 20 over there, 30, 40, 50, I've got 100 at the back there. 125, 150, 170 over there, I've got 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, 25, 2, 50, 2, 75, at 3, at 3, at 3, at 3, at 3, 55, at 3, 50 now, at 4, at 4, at 4, 100, at 4, at 4, at 4, from the cardinal, at 4, 2 from the outfield, at 4, and 2, so the good Lord, going, going, and sold, S O U L, we are sold, here we go. <laughs> I was born on the 19th on the 16th of October, 1960. So that makes me somewhere between 57 and death. <laughs> I come from a family of six children. I lost my sister when I was 21 years of age from a massive brain hemorrhage in front of me, which turned me away from the faith. But the wound was deeper when my father, John, walked out on my mother with six children and left the family in despair. I saw all the family cry trying to handle it in different ways, and I thought, I'm not going to be like that. I'm going to be trying to be joyful. I'm not going to let anybody know that I was in pain and suffering. So for many years of my life, until my sister died, that's how my life was. When my sister died, and my sister was lying on the operating table with her breast exposed, blood all over, I made this promise, I will never believe in God again. But God's ways aren't our ways. Eventually, I found myself, several years later, coming back to the faith. But I had to go through a difficult journey. It was a journey of laughter. It was a journey of sorrow. Because laughter has always been in my life. I worked as an R-rated comedian for 20 years in my life. Now the R is for religious. <laughs> I've actually started a religious magazine for men called Pray Boy. It's going very well. And I used to work in all the nightclubs, strip clubs, footy shows. I've got my children here, so I have to be careful what I say, because I say, you did it, Dad, why can't we do it? <laughs> so my life changed, and it changed because of one thing, because of the prayers of my 97-year-old grandmother. Because when I saw my sister die, I became very angry. I never had alcohol, I never took drugs. But I had been given a gift of humour, but I used to use it in the wrong way. And my grandmother said to me once, when you have, you've been given a gift, son, you don't have to be dirty to make people laugh. Trust in God. Trust in Our Lady. They'll help you. I said, Nan, thanks, but no thanks. So for the next number of years, I drifted along that path of going down a one-way street and I wasn't coming back. One night, things were so bad, I thought life's not worth living. And I was contemplating driving my car into the river. And the words of my grandmother came back to me. When you have nowhere to go, trust in Jesus. And for one moment in my life, as you look at the ones that you love in your life, I looked at her life and I thought, here's a lady, 97, eight children. She lost six of them. Her firstborn son died at 16. Her last boy born into the world was a Down syndrome, who they said would never live past 16. And he died at 63 at Nazareth House, beautifully cared for by Sister John, who's here today. So some doctors try and play God, but they fail miserably. But I was soon to be taken to the doctor of divine mercy, medicine, divine mercy Jesus, the merciful Jesus. So when I thought of my grandmother, I thought maybe there is something to having faith. So the next day I walked into a church. I knelt in front of the tabernacle and I said, Lord, I don't even know if I believe, but if you're there, please help me. It was the first time in 29 years that I opened up the door of my heart that the Lord's rays of mercy was able to penetrate into a heart that was cold, insensitive, angry, impure, and changed my heart. But it was a gradual step because I took the first step, but the Lord knew that if I took too many steps in a way, I would turn back. So when I walked out of the church, I saw a leaflet on marrying apparitions. Within six months, I found myself going to this place because I'd start to spend 10 minutes a day in prayer, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and I start to experience peace, peace which I really didn't have since my father left. And I had to attend what I would think is the greatest sacrament, for me anyway, at that point in time, was confession. Now, the greatest miracles take place in confession. 
I've never had the grace of seeing our Lord. I've never seen our Lady. The greatest miracle in my life is my conversion back to the faith, and it happened through confession. Now, I was scared. Now, many people have heard of Medjugorje, yes? Any people been there? Okay. So you can see there's all priests from all corners of the world come to this place called Medjugorje. And I said to our Lord, now, I'm happy to go to confession because I know some of these priests, they can speak a little English, but they can't understand it all that well. <laughs> so I'm wondering if I go to confession, could you please give me one of those priests? So I worked up enough courage, opened up the confessional door, knelt down, and I hear this. Uh, G'day, welcome to the Sacrament of Reconciliation. <laughs> I got an Aussie. <laughs> and I was there for 45 minutes, and I was able to release all the hurt, anger, pain, anxiety, fear, everything, everything, embarrassing as it was. And when the priest said, I absolve you in the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, amen, I felt this incredible lightheadedness over my whole soul and I saw light, just light. I walked outside, I saw a lady in front of me, she had a book with the image of the merciful Jesus on the front and I was attracted to the face. I said, where can I get this book? She was from Cork in Ireland. She said, have you never heard of the Divine Mercy? I said, never. She got, here you go, son. I'll give you this book. This book may change your life. And I opened it up and it summed up my life in one sentence. The greater the sinner, the greater the right to my mercy. I started to read about Divine Mercy. I was going from Medjugorje to Ireland for a holiday to go back to the place where my grandparents came from. And it was in Dublin. And the bookstore, Divine Mercy Publications, was around the corner. I went there, followed up. I was in there within five minutes. And the man says to me, oh, would you like to start Divine Mercy Publications in Australia? I said, oh, no, I'm not interested. <laughs> so this is true. Trust me, I'm a funeral director. I'll be the last person to let you down. <laughs> so I went back home, but I felt God was still calling me to do something. So I changed my act from being R-rated. And when I talk R-rated, it's probably triple X-rated. And I changed my act. And people said, you won't get work. People know you as Percy and Dickie. You won't get work. So I trusted in God. And I used to sit into the chapel. I'd say, Lord, if you give me this talent, help me to write songs. Because I used to do musical parodies on songs, change the words and those sort of things. And I started to increase more in my work. But I started to feel that my passion was no longer for entertainment. It was for our Lord. And this gentleman rang me up again, Val Conan, And he said, we're having our first conference in 1991. Would you like to come over for it? I said, I have no money. He said, pray to the divine mercy. So I got off the phone, knelt in front of the image. I said, Lord, if you want me to promote divine mercy, you have to help me. Within three days, a gentleman rings me up from the country. We came down, had a chat, took out a checkbook. I thought, well, I'm not selling him a house. What's he doing? <laughs> and he wrote me out a check and he gave me a check for $5,000 without me saying anything. I said, can I just ask you why you give me this money? He said, I'm giving this money to start Divine Mercy Publications. That was in 1991. Since that lady handed him that first booklet in Medjugorje in 1991, there's been well over a million pieces of literature, images, pictures, prayer cards, leaflets, gone out throughout the whole Oceania region. Not by me, but by you, faithful apostles of mercy. And that's why you've been called along here today. What is an apostle? An apostle is someone who is sent out. So today we send you out with the fire of divine mercy, lighting a world that's in darkness, lighting a world that seems to be in so much control of the evil one. And believe me, Satan hates divine mercy. I was so honoured to hear when Archbishop Grusus mentioned about Father Sapochko falling eight metres onto, his, um, onto the ground. Well, a similar experience happened to me when I was five metres up on a ladder and for unknown reasons... The ladder goes underneath me. As I'm about to fall, I hear these words, don't hit the concrete. Something grabbed me, moved me about three feet. I hit the Toyota, broke six ribs. Oh, what a feeling. And <laughs> and the next nine months was a very harrowing time for me. I had to learn to talk properly again. I still suffer from uh, what they call vertigo. And it was a very difficult time of darkness. But there was a priest, Father Morris Ward, who was a great help, who's here to me today. He helped me through this time. And it was through that darkness and through that suffering, and it was suffering, 
I come to understand just the role that St Faustina has played in my life. St Faustina should be the model to us as apostles of mercy. We should look, we should read, we should live by her life. Be joyful, accept sufferings. And yes, at times she didn't trust. And I can assure you, and my wife will back me up, at times I don't trust the way in which I could. Four weeks ago, we had 70 people registered for this Congress. Four weeks ago. Karen just said, keep trusting, keep trusting. St Faustina was a humble instrument chosen by our Lord. We are all humble in the fact that we have come along here today to learn more, to partake more, to be apostles of mercy. Don't think you have to be the person that someone else thinks you are. Not everybody's called to get up and to witness, but we are called to love and to show mercy to those whom we love. That's my story. That's how I became involved in Divine Mercy. And I know one day, when I stand under the umbrella of Divine Mercy, I'm going to see each and every one of you bringing so many merciful souls to the heart of Christ. Remember the words of Pope John Paul II, whoever sincerely says, Jesus, I trust in you, will find comfort in all his fears. The antidote, the antidote for fear is trust. To receive, you simply trust. It's been my pleasure to host and be the MC for the Congress. I've tried to use the gift that I have in humour to bring you to understand that God is a God of joy. God is a God of hope. And God is a God of infinite mercy. Never underestimate the talents that he has given you. Don't hide them. Use them. Be yourself. Because by being yourself, you will bring people back to the merciful Jesus. I thank you for your time, I thank you for your presence, and I finish with the words of Blessed Johnny Canavan. <laughs> There's no words, I haven't died yet. Okay. <laughs> That's it. <laughs>